in the darkest worlds that ever were. The only thing that brings light are stories. Those stories are kept in one place. The tiny bookcase. <laughs> Hello, explorers of the Sacred Library. Hello. I'm Nico. And I'm Ben. And you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. Welcome to another episode of Season 2. Today, we've got someone extra spooky joining us. Very much so. Our guest is described by the scrolls as a writer of quiet horror with a creeping dread. We'd like to welcome Benjamin Langley. Hello, Benjamin. Hello there. How has your year been? It has been a very strange year indeed. Yeah, I've, I've put out two novels in the last year, and it's not the best time to be releasing work, just as everything locks down. Um, all of the events that I was supposed to be doing and attending suddenly got cancelled. Oh, no. The book launches went ahead regardless, and I found myself uh, trying to scream about them online as best I could. It's been very peculiar. But it's tough. been nice to, yeah, it has been tough. But you know, you get on with it. Yeah. Uh, productive though. Did you did you find being locked inside helped? To some degree, but because I teach, I found that I was I was working just as much as I would have been anyway in that regard, right. which has been that that's had its own challenges, but. It did mean, it did take away so many other things that, that I could have done. So there has been time to start work on new and different projects. It's not been a great time to finish projects, though. So there's been lots of things started. Okay. I can absolutely vouch for that as a lifestyle <laughs> yes. choice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say the same. Um, having uh, having begun a novel but not finished it yet. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that, yeah. does, that, that, that does that does read true to me as well. Apart from this podcast, it's uh, <laughs> something that we we said. Oh, it'll, it'll probably be easier after a lockdown, and then you know, well, it anyway. Yeah, although although it's uh, lovely to be able to talk to you like this. Ideally, we'd be talking to you in person, Ben. And yes, uh, uh, we. Uh, so we're looking forward to being able to do that. Hopefully, when the world eventually unfucks itself. <laughs> yeah, I I was I was supposed to be going to to an event um in April 2020, and it's just been rescheduled again for March 2022. Oh, and it, it's, crikey! It's that kind of thing. It's like, well, I th they they put it off first of all until the summer, and then the January um of this year, and then and then it was a case of no, let's just punt it forward another 14 months. Hopefully, things will be okay then. I think that's the thing. It's the hopefully that's really getting us all. Yes. Various levels of optimism dictating the way that we plan our lives. The the music industry has no idea at the moment. I can say that with absolute clarity. The, like, yeah. Some venues just aren't even booking shows for this year because they just expect to have to move them. It's, it's nuts. Oh, I remember right at the start back in March, it was a case of gigs were cancelled for just a couple of months. Yeah. But then it just became indefinite. Oh, yeah. well, do you know what? I need, I'm going to improve the mood, I think. I think it's time yes, to... please. Should we have a, should we have a positive? Let's yes. Start. Well, in that case, I suggest a story. And once again, I'm deferring. I'm going to make Ben do it. And this is, this is my Ben, not guest Ben. This could become an issue. So... <laughs> Our prompt this time is the giant. The giant. How tall actually are you? Is the first real thing most people say to me. All of the normal conversational pleasantries up until that point put in defensive service on my behalf. Sometimes I even manage to end conversations before they feel comfortable enough to make me feel uncomfortable. Interactions with colleagues are a struggle, though, as they feel like they know me. Once on a semi-compulsory work night out, James demanded to know how massive my penis was. I left before he'd finished laughing. 
I had to stop at the lights on my way back. The traffic was heavy. Car after car rolled past. I didn't mind, though. It gave me a reason to stand still and lose myself, if only for a moment. I was the only pedestrian making the crossing. All of the cars, with all of the people inside them, came to a stop, just for me. I walked across the road and kept my flushed face pointing away from them, unwilling to see the puzzlement on their window screen tinted faces. That was the first time I really noticed the green door. It was just across from my place, and I saw the woman say goodbye to someone with a kiss. The next day, Kate offered to get me a coffee from the machine at work. She was already on her way, she said. I didn't really know how to say yes, so I said no. I noticed that she'd painted her nails red. Nothing appealed to me on TV that night, so I tried reading. My brain felt mired, and I couldn't make anything more than the shallowest of meanings out of what I was reading. I had to put the book down. The woman was outside again earlier, wearing that skirt with the belt over and practical high heels. I wondered if she enjoyed having coffee with people. The way she was leaning against the green door reminded me of a painting I'd seen once. Kate didn't ask me again the following day. I had practiced saying yes, so it wouldn't have been a problem. My keyboard stopped working when I pressed the escape key. They should make them tougher. James laughed at me. On my way back home, I saw some binoculars in a charity shop window. I bought them. The man behind the counter smelled of dust motes and tuna fish. I could tell he was going to stare at my hands as I counted the money out, so I turned away from him to do it. I don't know why people watch reruns of shows if they've already seen them. Who hasn't seen Friends? Why is it always on, being repeated over and over again? Maybe television is stuck in a loop. Or people are. She wasn't out there that night. Another woman was, though. I don't like her as much. I was told my performance had been satisfactory at work during the next quarterly review. Apparently, it is possible to be above average at moving numbers from one column into another. James told me one of his stories today. He likes to go to bars and pick up women. When he tells them about himself, he uses famous stories from films as his life story. I think he saw that in a movie and copied it as well. I failed to see how having his mother shot in a forest was in any way erotic. He went to talk to Kate instead, and I tried not to listen when they whispered my name. The batteries on the remote died, so I didn't watch television. Instead, I watched her from the window with the used binoculars through a gap in my musty curtains. She looked so approachable in the nimbus glow of the streetlight. She looked like she would want to talk to me, as myself. Five men went inside with her that night, one after the other. That seemed a lot to me. Kate was being strange the next day. Whenever she walked past my cubicle, she was looking down. She nearly knocked over the water cooler. I bought some batteries and rented Pretty Woman on Impulse after an hour of scrolling through streaming services. I had to turn it off when I made the connection. I ordered pizza again and told the delivery man through the door to leave it outside. Cooking is just another job I wish I didn't have to do. The couple in the upstairs flat were loud. They tried to cover it with music, but I knew what they were doing. I didn't look at the green door that night, in case the other woman was there. I preferred to think about the one I liked. I couldn't go into work the following day. James would have had that smile of conquest on his face. I suppose he thinks it's an apologetic smile. He always looks so pleased with himself, though, and so ignorant of how much I dislike him. She was out again that night. The little things she does make me smile, like when she twitches her coat up to cover her exposed shoulder and the way she lights her cigarettes. I wondered what her name was. I was going to go in that day. I'd had a shower and was dressed when the phone rang. Work checking up on me. I told them I was ill. When I went to the shop to buy groceries, I realised how much I hated that shadow that followed me around during the day. It stretched away from me for a seemingly endless distance and ostentatiously blotted out the sun for anything it touched. I was thinking about that when I noticed that I was outside her house. She wasn't there, as it was the day, but I was struck by how different it looked up close. The paint on the door had peeled to reveal rotting wood. There were marks where numbers used to read 37. I knew her front garden gate was squeaky, otherwise I would have gone up to stand where she always stands. I told myself during the following days that if she was there that night, I would go over. But my courage deflated with every sunset. I stopped answering my phone and it stopped ringing after a few days. I knelt by my window and watched, fearing that my shadow would be a frighteningly large silhouette barely encased by the window frame. Then came the night when I waited for hours, 
and she never appeared. Not even the other woman came out that night. I realised I had been crying until there wasn't any wet left in me. The next day, I found myself waiting by her gate, filled with purpose. As soon as the sun began to die off, the street lamp above me flickered to life. Its glow felt warmer than daylight to me. I heard the door open and turned to see her. She looked me over. In her gaze, I didn't see any of the wonder, pity or fear that everybody else failed to hide. Wordlessly, she beckoned me inside and in I went. The money I held was delicately removed from my hands. A lingering stroke of her fingertips made them feel normal for a moment. I became truly naked for the first time and felt my existence change. As soon as it began, she spoke to me of fairy tales and storybooks, of causeways and beanstalks. As our flesh pressed, I could see those worlds coalesce around me into a reality I could breathe in. There, I could be a monstrous villain or a man of heroic proportions, and the choice was mine. I was not out of place. I was a part of the place. I was me, and being me meant something. I carry the memory of those worlds with me now, wherever I go. And all I have to do to live them again is go through that green door at number 37 with her. Next time, I think I'll stay there for as long as I can. That was deeply sad. Poor fucker. Very sad. <clears throat> It's very sad, yeah. I like your choice to take the giant and place him in the ordinary world rather than the fairy tale world. And the fairy tale world, when it is referred to, is somewhere where he can imagine he is all of these things that people think of with giants. You you paint this picture of him as an, an anxious mess and mm. you can really feel for him because of that. It was a really interesting way of humanizing what would have, in a story from another person's perspective, had him as a as a monstrous figure. He was very tall, and you, you know, you spoke about the, the curtains of his place being dirty, and he he wouldn't open the door, and he was watching a woman through binoculars. Like it's very easy for that character to be the baddie, for lack a of serious, a serious creeper. Yeah, yeah, but because it was so told sympathetically. It it made him something else, and that was really interesting to to hear. It was um, loosely loosely based on um, someone that I, I vaguely knew as as a kid um, who had gigantism and was very very tall um, and uh, deeply deeply shy because of it. Yeah, um, and they were uh, they they were he was he was an absolutely lovely guy. And um, but whenever he would pay for something, he would do what I described, which was turn away to count his change because he didn't want yeah. people to watch his hands move over the over the small coins. Um, so, yeah, it was it was one of the first things that struck me when um, when you chose the uh, when you chose the prompt, Benjamin, it's sort of that that memory. So I went with that. But also yeah. I. Um, I actually took a look back through some of my um, stories that I'd, that I'd written at um, at university and not used, and uh, I found about five hundred words or so of a story that became this story that I've just read to you now. But it was far more like angsty teenage nonsense. Um, uh, the the main character wasn't didn't have gigantism, all that kind of stuff. It was just an absolute creeper with a brothel opposite him. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. So that those five hundred words got drilled down into about two hundred, and then back up to I think that came in at around thirteen hundred in the end. So obviously so, we're actively doing a lot of writing at the moment. How different did you find looking at your old stuff? Just out oh, of interest. It was crazy. It was awful. <laughs> it was so bad. Um, it was <laughs> yeah. I mean, this this that story that I mentioned. It was written in twenty eleven, so it's ten years old. Um. And there were bits and pieces that were were good, and some of those, some of those sentences still remain in one form or another in this. Um, but it was a real testament to how regularly writing can not just improve your writing, but also improve your confidence of of your writing as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was I was I, you know I didn't feel 
I didn't feel distraught that I'd written something so bad. I just felt I just felt like, oh, cool. I'll just I'll just take my chisel to it, sort of thing. Make it make so, it as good as I can. By the nature of our podcast, we sometimes have about two hours to look back at our stories. So going back with a decade is uh, that's a very different experience, isn't it? Yeah, it was it was interesting <laughs> because we get given the he chose the prompts the giant Ben. Yes. Um, and to look at an old bit of writing through a new lens actually really brought it to life for me, um, which is something that I've not done before. So that was an exciting first for me today. There's, there's a lot to admire in it. The, the, when you talked about the memory that you had of, of um, the person you knew who turned his back to, to count mm. um, out the, the money, that's something which kind of really came to life. And things, the fact that he was dressed ready to go to work, but when the phone rang and they were checking on him, couldn't do it so it's and you, you never had to tell us how he was feeling within that mm. we got that through what he experienced i'm glad that it came across yeah it was i i don't actually feel this level of anxiety myself personally but i i do know people that um feel like a version of what i've what i've described in that story not because they have gigantism just because a lot of people have anxiety don't they um and uh, i i was kind of trying to get that across i think I, I'm not entirely sure whether it worked. Maybe you can confirm it for me. But um, the bit where he's talking about how he's sort of ashamed of his shadow, I, I wasn't sure whether that read correctly. Did did you get the impression that it was because he was a was ashamed of how large his, a shadow he cast? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, I, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Good. Good. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, yeah. I know we said we were going to bring the uh, bring the tone up a little bit, but I'm afraid I had to give you a st- sad one for that one. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I, I don't mean that. It was a very sad but very lovely story. So, Lovely might not be the right word. It was very nicely <laughs> written and performed. It wasn't necessarily a pleasant story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that's, that's one Ben done. I'm going to turn to the other one now to, to Benjamin. I'm going to say, please tell me your one isn't that sad. Well, he's not a jolly giant, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure you're going to be too happy at the end of it, to be honest. I don't, I don't think any stories about giants have happy endings, really, do they? It's not for the giants, at least. We're definitely, no. making, we're definitely being sure not to make promises our asses can't <laughs> cash it, aren't we? I like it, right? <laughs> yeah. Come on, start writing that arse check. Let's have your story, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> Healthy water sloshed from the wooden bucket and onto the straw that covered the floor as Isaac struggled through the doorway. Behind him was his younger brother, Arthur, carrying a long, narrow willow and reed basket damaged at one end. William Growler gazed up from the table where he had been fixing another broken eel trap. He placed the bodkin back in the grease horn next to his knives and hammer and gripped the table. Let me help you, Dad. Isaac placed the bucket down and moved towards his father. No, I'm okay. William struggled to his feet and, supporting himself with the edge of the table, shuffled round to where he could peer into the bucket. A single eel writhed inside. We're going to have to find somewhere else to put them. Isaac took the broken hive from Arthur and placed it in the corner of the room with the others. River's getting shallow. Arthur pulled on Isaac's sleeve. Shall we tell him? Arthur was only six. Too young to be out emptying and replacing traps with his older brother, who was twice his age. What else could William do but put his boys to work? Not now, Isaac said, ruffling Arthur's hair. William fell back into his seat at the table with a grunt. No, go ahead. Tell me. Arthur smiled. I saw the giant. William's fingers curled into fists as every muscle in his body tightened. New pain and the memory of past horrors commingled in the base of his feet and spread waves of blazing agony radiating through his body. Why don't you boys see if your mother wants some help in the garden? Arthur rushed out. 
Isaac paused at the doorway, staring at his father, before eventually following. It was all William could do to suppress a cry. The walls were thin, and he couldn't risk letting his family hear. He gazed at his feet. He barely functioned. If the giant had returned, he'd have to put them to work once more. The door opened and William's wife, Martha, edged in, carrying a basket of vegetables newly dug up from the garden. Boys, she called back to them, I forgot the mugworts. Could you grab some, please? He closed the door and placed the basket by the stove. It doesn't mean anything, she said. William took hold of a small knife and turned it over in his hand. You heard what he said. Martha leant on the table, looking her husband in the eye. And you know how your brother loves to fill Arthur's head with tall tales. It's all black shook this, shug monkey that. No wonder he's always claiming to see boggarts, will-o'-the-wisps, and now giants. William shook his head. The river's drying up. They must have restarted the drainage. That's why he's back. Arthur touched William's hand. You don't have to get involved. Maybe it's time to let it be. You can't stop progress forever. What kind of life is that for our boys? Our family have been catching and selling eels for centuries. If I can't pass that on to them, what kind of father am I? Hear Arthur's story. It might not be what you think. William nodded, but the weight of the words of one so small was heavy indeed. It took a long time to settle Arthur for bed that evening, as he repeated his tale of a booming voice, hideous features, and a heavy club, thicker than the widest branch of the witch elm trees that grew upon the hill. His elaborate tale brought a degree of comfort to William. It was so unlike the giant he knew. Yes, the giant was powerful, devastatingly so. But he bore no club. His hands were all he needed for his acts of savagery and destruction. His voice did not boom. He spoke in a whisper that necessitated undesired proximity. And rather than looking monstrous, despite his bigness, he was almost handsome. And yet William could not rest easy. Perhaps Arthur caught a glimpse of the giant and embellished this brief moment with fairy tale imagination, keen to emulate his uncle as a storyteller. There was only one way to be certain. He had to venture out into the night, for if the giant had returned, he would be waiting. A chill wind blew in from the east as William travelled over the bleak terrain. Even with his boots stuffed with eel skins, he needed two sticks to walk with which made carrying the lantern a struggle. With each gust, he feared the lantern would be wrenched from his awkward grip. Few would risk a journey in the darkness unless necessary, and none as racked with pain would be so daring, so foolish. He moved slowly, more slowly even than usual, using his sticks to test the firmness of the ground before him, appearing as far ahead as he could with his dim light. It was alarming how much more solid the ground had become. As a boy, at this time of the year, he would have been wading up to his knees walking over the very same spots. Every step was agony. The mere mention of the giants had flared up past trauma and the old wounds ached. Ignoring the pain in his feet, he shuffled along towards the bridge. Once upon it, he peered along the river. Yes, a new platform had been built. Men had returned once more to commence their drainage operation. The water, drifting towards the bridge, was splintered wooden struts, a sign of the destruction the creature was capable of. The giant's work too had already commenced, and for that he would require payment. William had to find him in order to make an offer while the cost was still in his control. He crossed the bridge and made his way to the split rock hidden within the copse of trees. His feet were entirely numb, 
There he had nothing more to give. Upon the rock, illuminated by the lantern, sat the giant. His smile spread across his face in a hungry grin. William shuddered as he recalled the horror of his most recent visit. He stumbled, and the giant reached out to steady him. William remained close enough to feel the warmth emitting from the giant's enormous body. You're back. Only because you need me, giant said in a voice so quiet it was as if it only existed in William's head. William hated the creature all the more because he was right. In his trek across the fen, even in darkness, the damage of drainage was apparent. The reeds with which he built his traps had withered. The old waterways, the places where once William and now his boys lay their eel traps, and dry as the newly cut channels carried the water from the lands and his livelihood from out of his grasp. Once more, he needed the giant to wreak havoc upon their drains and their sluices, to grab the men and tear them asunder if that's what it took to stop their operation. But if the giant was to work, he'd need feeding. As William had done last time, he gazed up into the giant's eyes, hoping to see a hint of compassion. I have nothing, William said. The first time, decades ago, the giant had demanded only coins, and that was sufficient until William ran out of money. For the last decade, livestock had been enough to feed the giants, but even the last of the wildfowl had long since departed the area. The giant refused the eels that William could supply so readily and demanded something more. Again, crippling agony struck as he recalled removing his boots the last time he came to the split rock. It was as if the giant had taken hold of that little toe and yanked it right off all over again before moving on to the next and the next and the next, popping each into his mouth chewing sloppily. Losing his toes made working near impossible, but thankfully his boys had grown up enough to place and empty the traps. They need not be your toes, the giant said. Could he wake Martha, bring her here? She'd benefited too from keeping the land the way it was. Why should he bear the burden alone? I've seen how sprightly your youngest boy walks, the giant said. No, William cried. Not that. Then what? Will you accept another part in exchange? William said. The boys had learned to lay the traps. They could learn to fix them too. The giant's hungry grin grew wider still, and in acquiescence of the deal, William held out his hand, but not to be shaken. Crikey, what a tale. I, I, I loved that. I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. It was really, it, there were so many evocative moments in it. Um, and you, you sort of built the world very comfortably at the start and then saw it through with some ex excellent, like, fairy tale level horror. Um, Loved it, like in particular the um, I got this real, real strong sense of when he goes out to see the giant, and you start to get the, the get what he's been sacrificing, what's been happening here, and it's this like horrible uh, realization, but also inside that realization is exactly how badass this man is, <laughs> uh, just like straight, basically like hobbling out in onto a fen to give up more body parts is a really strong image, some really strong. Is it? Um... I was just going to say this. Something said for a man who is so stubbornly insisting on maintaining his eel trade that he will allow a monster to pull off his <laughs> toes, which, by the way, is a horrible image. Congratulations! It's <laughs> one by one, like chocolates out of a fucking milk tray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit much, but <laughs> you do what you got to do, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> the giant was definitely a toe gobbling sleut. <laughs> Right 
Oh, lovely. Um, did, was it at all? Uh, it reminded me um, when you were talking about eel traps and uh, losing the fen to drainage and that kind of thing. It reminded me of somewhere in East Anglia called, I think it's Wiccan Fen. Um, yes. The, there's an old uh, Bronze Age site there that they've managed to uh, sort of keep, they, they unearthed it. It'd been, it's all made of wood, but because of the, the, the bog nature of the fens or whatever, they, it's sort of been preserved sort of. But one of the things that they preserved is, a, is an ancient, literally ancient, ancient from the Bronze Age eel trap. Um, You're going to say they'd unearthed so, a gigantic yeah. skeleton that had toe, toe <laughs> bones in the roof cage. <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah, they have great stuff at, at Wick and Fen, and it does really evoke some of what it was like so many hundreds of years ago. And I've, I've written a few stories lately that have had this kind of same time setting just using some of the, the regional folklore sometimes um sometimes just using this this idea of, of fen drainage and, and how that affected people um but it certainly wasn't kind of the, the starting point with my thinking but it's it's where i ended up when i started mm. writing it it's a, it's a really strong uh like dirty idyll i think that historical setting and then as it sort of blends upwards into a horrific uh fantasy with uh, the the reality of the giant and the hidden cost of his help or their help um that was I, I feel like that was a really strong entry uh, there was one particular bit really early on that got me and i i, I even wrote it down because I, I was sort of really impressed by it um the giant spoke in a whisper that necessitated unwanted proximity that was really that, that really got me i was like i i could completely see myself in that situation where you just you need to lean in to hear him but you really don't want to because he's going to take something <laughs> off you yes yeah that having to be close yeah. i also had to use I, I couldn't resist using the word bigness <laughs> in there um <laughs> Because of Jekyll and Hyde, it, it appears in Jekyll and Hyde a couple of times. They talk about how when 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 Jekyll is Hyde, when he's caught in that body, he's wearing clothes of Jekyll's bigness, and the word seems so wrong. I had to use. I'm all it. about it. I like it. <laughs> Nick, Nick I, likes bigness. Big, I'm a big fan of bigness. <laughs> <laughs> Massively. <laughs> He's the biggest. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think we've, we've beaten <laughs> that one to death. Haven't we? I was, wow. I was gonna say I, I really like the idea of you know, it's quite a classic concept, the the trade with the Fey folk. But for it to be mm, actually yeah. because not because the giant is in some way intrinsically magical, but because it is big enough to smash up the infrastructure that's screwing with the eel trade. I really like that as a <laughs> as a thing. Because it's you know, added a new dimension to that classic idea. I agree. I agree. Thank you. That was that was very impressive. Thank you. Uh, which leaves us with uh, one more story for this episode from uh, from our very own Nick. Also, not a positive one. I feel like this we've <laughs> oh, no! we've gone down a dark <laughs> path today. Oh, where is the jolly green giant of the uh, of the sweet corn trade? Y'all bitches looking for sweet corn. <laughs> sweet corn comes flying out. <laughs> That's my whole story. There you go. Happy podcast, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs> oh, okay. I guess I better... Uh... I remember the first time Father told us stories of the giant. I did not believe him, because such a monster could not exist. He said that it walked on two feet and each of its strides was as long as a dozen of us. Its footfalls would send echoes roaring through the spaces we lived in. He said it hunts us relentlessly, but not to feed on our bodies, or because we were a danger to it. Father said that they were scared we would eat their food, or soil their home. Uncle told us the scary parts of the stories. He told us they lay great shining traps that would crush the very heart of you. It would punish you for trying to save yourself from starvation. My sister and I would whisper late into the night about this terrible myth. 
the giant that hunted our kind. My little sister had squeaked with fright as I embellished the stories in a childish effort to fill her with dread. I was young and naive then, and could never have put into words, limited as I was, the true horror of the giant. We make our raids for food at night. This has always been the way. When we lost father, and I took his place as leader of my clan, I did not change this tradition, though I did question it. Uncle did, as he always has, and told me the details my father would not. The sunlight hours do not belong to us, boy, but to the giant. It roams, then. It feeds and it bellows. Go at night, when only the rumbles of its slumber ring. I took him at his word, though I had no love for creeping in the shadow. Filled, then, I was with ideas of valour. Foolhardy and unlearned, I began to brew, in the cauldron of imagination, a belief that I could brazenly go to the food place in the sunlight hours. Some of my friends, other young ones with no grey in their fur, agreed with my sentiments, and one night, when we were dizzy with the sugars of dried fruits, we made a rash decision. In the day that would soon break, we would go to the food place and prove that the giant was a myth, that the food was ours by rights, and that we did not live in fear. I'd never seen the Hall of the Giant in the light of morning before, and the floor beneath me was strangely incandescent. The light danced across its pale surface and near blinded us. One of those who came whimpered then. Their words are still with me now. Please, we cannot be here. Listen. I pricked my ears and noticed the absence of something. Those rumbles that normally came in the dark times, the ones my father had called the giant snores, were missing. They were always present, normally, when we came here. We had decided, those of us who did not believe, that this was simply the rushing of water from some unknown source. But now, the dreadful silence left in its wake was almost deafening. In a moment of panic, I was turned about, blinded by the light of the floor, deafened by the cacophony of unknown sounds and the gap left by that familiar one. We cannot turn back. I hear my own words, and feel I must have borrowed them from another, or in that moment I would not have said them. The one who spoke before does not meet my eyes, and I am glad of it then, for I believe they would portray the fear coiling in my belly. Do you smell that? My friend, Lowclaw, speaks, his nose raised and probing the air. I copy him, looking for whatever scent has piqued his interest. It's there. A rich stink that makes my whiskers twitch. I do know it. I've only smelled it once before. My father brought home a piece of that yellow wonder. That crumbly, soft meat that had me dancing with joy. Jeez. Yes. Lowclaw, I smell it. We have purpose now. Which has distracted at least the two of us from the potential danger so we follow the strings of stink that hang in the air. I cannot lie. The exhilaration of our venture was thrilling me. It was separate from the burdens of leadership. I was not chieftain long-tailed one now. I was just a small one looking for his prize. We found it, after not too long, our prize. It sat aboard a plinth, and Lowclaw hurried to it, 
Look, friend, look. It is cheese. His eyes were bright with excitement as he grabbed for that prize. A crack that split the heavens resounded, and the plinth seemed to fold in two. A steel bar as thick as my tail crushed Lowclaw's ribs, and he screamed a terrible sound. It sounded like every scary story my father had ever told me. I watched the panic in his eyes for the few moments that they still had light in them. I was so very sorry in a way I cannot explain. I had failed him as chief as a friend, and then I heard them, its pounding footsteps, boom, 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 just like the stories, run, run, all of you flee, scamper toes, climb far and fast, often scurries, flee, I stood and watched the shadows creep across the glistening floor. I felt the movements of it in my feet. The thing that came I can hardly describe. It was not covered with fur. Rather, its face, which was flat and miles above me, was pink and smooth. Atop this head there was fur. It had long limbs. Only two were feet, and the other a pair of soft, grasping claws. It swayed with no grace in its movement. Each of its lumbering footfalls seemed the harbinger of some titanic collapse. It saw me then, and Lowclaw, crushed and killed. Its great maw opened, revealing rows of flat white fangs, and it screamed. A wail that made me think my skull would burst. Mom! A mouse! My panic broke then, for I saw death in its eyes, and I knew that our time had come. One of its traps was sprung, and now it would hunt me to the end of our days. Not for food! Just for sport. Exactly as father had said. I flew then as fast as my feet would take me and squeezed into the crack from where we came. We could never use it again. Not now. Not now that monstrosity was roaring. And then a series of louder crashes. I dared to look. To take the smallest glance. Another monster, bigger even than the first. Its eyes flashing wild and hungry. One of its gigantic feet lashed and threw Lowclaw sideways. My friend. My poor friend. The smaller giant was pointing at my hiding place, and the big one ran for me. I was frozen, unsure and breathless. Not a moment too soon, I snapped back to reality, as a grasping claw wriggled toward me. Summoning all my bravery, I bit it, and the giant giant howled in pain. It tasted foul to me, and I heard it shriek as I ran home, to hide and live forever fearful. I tell the stories now, as my father did in the hope that young mice will believe me. There are terrible giants out there. They hunt us for sport, and their traps are deadly. Against them, we cannot win. That's uh, two badass ones in a row, I feel. That was uh, really, really something. I loved the like uh, uh, Vietnam War vet approach to the narration. That felt that was that was 
it add, added a whole level of complexity to the whole thing, which I thought was excellent. Lieutenant Dan the Mouse. That's <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that's an aspect I really enjoyed too. The the, the language choices as he was was telling um, retelling this story, we had the perspective where we we understood how small this event is compared to how mammoth it is for the narrator so i like that perspective yeah it's sort of it's, i'm not entirely sure what the actual term for it is but it's 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 a kind of unreliable narrator isn't it where they are they don't have the same information as us when you know when you're trying to guess who is i know i know it was fairly obvious from early on that, it, that they were mice but at the same time it wasn't you didn't just go he looked at his mouse friend you know, you, did, yes. you know, you, you, you greetings, um, fellow mice. You showed you, exactly, yeah. You, sh you, sh um, you showed us rather than told us, which yeah. is a sign of a good story. Um, it reminded me very strongly of Mouse Guard, the David Peterson comic books about mice that have a sort of medieval society and they uh, they look after their lands. You know, they've got little little, little acorn yeah. shields and. And that kind of thing, that like that moment when you, when, you, when he referred to himself as um, a valorous uh, yeah. person, I was thinking, oh yeah, that's that's got a real mouse guard. Definitely it was, started it was really cool. closer. The the first iteration of this, it was a bear rather than a human, and it was a giant they were going to slay. And ah, okay, it was, that, yeah, that it was, was kind of a fun good. fantasy jaunt. And I thought, no, I don't... <laughs> I'll make it sad because then you know we'll have a sad one in that <laughs> yeah. episode. Well, <laughs> rather than three sad ones, yep. should have should have gone with the, the uh, romp. Having having said that, there was a point where it, I felt like it could have turned to comedy, uh, not in a bad way. I mean, like in a uh, there was there was an aspect of them being caught out in their disbelief, you know, in their conspiracy theory yeah. approach. Like, so when they when they get out into the into the house and they're going on about how they don't believe that the what, what other people say about there being giants and, and that kind of thing. Um, I got, I very much got the sort of mental image of um, like flat earthers <laughs> out at sea. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I get yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any any chance of humour was was then lost with the death <laughs> of Loclaw, wasn't it? It's... Oh, Loclaw. He was he was so cool. He was he was yeah. a trusty More like companion Bro to be brought. With... <laughs> Bro uh, that, yeah, the description of the shining traps early on as the sort of Chekhov's yeah. trap worked very nicely, um, and uh, I really loved the description yeah. of cheese. That crumbly, yeah. soft meat cheese, <laughs> yellow one. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, now you say it like that, it just sounds like they were going for a like an enormous bag of cocaine, doesn't it? Like <laughs> you know when uh, you know in Tropic Thunder when Jack Black finds the heroin yeah. mound in the process yeah. of. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Whoops. Oh, rest in peace, local. Though that's that's going to, that's going to, that one's going to stick with me. I I do also enjoy stories which are about telling stories and the difference between the father's stories and the uncle's stories and how the uncle gave all of the grim details that are seemingly necessary to help them avoid yeah. their fates, their potential fates. That's very yeah. That's a good point. The. Uh... Yeah, it had a lot about the nature of storytelling and and like oral tradition in there as well, didn't it? Which was, yeah, it was it, it was uh, it was fascinating. I, I really enjoyed oh, it, mate. I'm it glad. Good. So we've had uh, <laughs> we've had three quite sad <laughs> stories about giants, Ver varieties of giants, of course. Yes, very all very different. That's my favourite thing about what we do on this podcast is that we we all go from the same prompts chosen by the guest. Um, and we never end up with the same stories. I assume it will happen one day. So somehow, yeah. Um, it's yeah, the Infinite Monkeys uh, thing, isn't it? It hasn't happened yet. Yeah. You put infinite podcasters yeah. in a room with infinite typewriters, eventually they'll all write the same story, is that? God, do you write yours on a typewriter? Oh, of course. It's costing me a fortune in ribbons. <laughs> Commitment. <laughs> <laughs> you spend most of the time like trying to... Uh, Sort of problem solve the machine that you're using rather than actually the, typing. The click clack clack ding can be heard for miles. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a weird thing to go on to, but I've I've never actually used a typewriter. I've pressed the buttons on one and fiddled about with it, but I've never actually yeah. written a document with a typewriter. I, I had a go once 
but that was about but if it. you do want to know you know old tech how old we are i faxed my details to university when i went so people still use fax man <laughs> no they don't yeah, guys but they do seem like a relic <laughs> <laughs> have you used the typewriter before ben i only to mess about with i, I remember mm. when i was a child my parents i think they they that they, they found one somewhere a relative passed it on to them and it was just a clack away at the keys I figure know. out why when you press this one yeah. these three keys together yes. it'll get stuck um but, but, but short of that no never seriously Imagine writing a, a novel on one jesus yeah a whole novel yeah. it would just be oh yeah not being able to just save draft versions as well would. Oh, I don't like that bit. Backspace, yeah. backspace. Oh no, wait, that doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just there. I guess is there something to be said for just getting it right the first time? Yeah, <laughs> um, I always associate them with um, Stephen King's misery. Yes, you yeah. see Paul Sheldon typing away, and then his manuscript. Um, the fact that there is only a single copy of it. And, yeah. And, the problems that causes yeah, the only thing worse than using a typewriter is using one with a smashed up leg i suppose yeah <laughs> yeah just on the typewriter <laughs> thing i recently found um a, a certificate that my uh grandmother had and as you know when you know in a sort of early uh, adult existence um for being a, a typist and you had to be able to type a certain amount of words a minute in on a typewriter yeah um and it was yeah and I, I i remember thinking even as a kid that um because the um cuz she could type on a computer very well but her hands would be a totally different angle like i don't know about you but i type with my hands quite flat to the keyboard yeah. whereas she was very it was up like her hands were held up like a t-rex and they would mm. they would stab down at the keys my uh, my mum's exactly the same she learned to she learned to touch type because she worked in a bank before right uh, i was born so my, the two things my mum is excellent at is gutting fish because she, my grandfather was a fishmonger and typing. She can't do anything else on a computer, but she can put out like 200 words a minute. It's mm. crazy. So I think it's a skill that's kind of disappeared now. Though. So we, yeah. we can all very practically use a, a keyboard. We can get a lot of words out, but we're almost certainly not doing it the most efficient way. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really learn to touch type until I started regularly using instant messaging services, which would have been the early days of MSN Messenger for me. IMing and video um, games, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Pretty much. Well, uh, let's. Uh, I'd quite like to uh, talk to you about uh, what's going on with you, Ben, and your outlooks on things. So, if you're willing, we've got some questions sure. for you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the first one's nice and easy. What are you reading at the moment? I just finished reading a book this morning called The Hunger by Alma Katsu, which is set in the mid 1800s, um, America, a wagon train heading from Illinois uh, on its way to California. They, they take a rather risky route choice through an area which is rumoured to be evil and there are hungry things there. It was <laughs> highly entertaining. It was a great Stanford. read. Yeah. Now, I've, I've also I've been trying to read a, a few books on writing recently. So I've, I finished one recently called uh, Writing in the Dark by Tim Wagoner, which is all about writing horror fiction and kind of tips on that. But that pointed me in the direction of a heap of other books. So I've got one here called Writing for Emotional Impact and, and another one which it's great for, for looking up injuries and things called uh, A Writer's Guide to Wounds and Injuries, Body Trauma. Now, when I got this book, I opened it up and on the first page that I, that I saw was figure eight, layers of the scalp. So lots of <laughs> delicious uh, information in there to share. Mm, brain um, soup. And then I've also been working through um, when I was when I was a kid, when I was about seven there was a comic book i used to get called scream it only ran for for something like 13 to 15 editions and then there was some kind of publishing dispute and i didn't mm -hmm. find out until the start of this year that some of my favorite stories in there were continued in other comics and i managed to pick up a compilation of them so one of them is called monster and which is about this boy's hideous uncle 
and the other is called the 13th floor which is about a hotel um where the computer can generate can turn the floor into things to torture people with and, and it's been great to revisit those and, and i can't believe i read them when i was seven or eight years old it's probably oh, wow. why i write what i write today but they're great absolutely great so you it sounds like you ha often have a lot of books on the go at once i tend to stick to kind of one novel and then then other things bits of non-fiction around it yeah so i mean yes yeah, there's another one by my by my bed my life in horror um by kit power which is a series of um articles about his experiences with different uh, books, with different films, different TV shows as he was growing up and how it has shaped his own writing. And, and I, I find I can duck in and out of nonfiction while continuing with a, a I, novel. I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I can see that. Do you find it, um, do you actually find it helpful to your own work to read about other writers and their processes? I do, yeah. Certainly um, with the Tim Wagoner book that, that I mentioned, there were a lot of things where I was reading through it and thinking, OK, I've tried to do that. And, and I also was able to reflect upon things I'd written and, and think that, that that's perhaps why some things hadn't quite hit the mark in the past and why some stories didn't work. Um, and certainly with, with the book I mentioned, The My Life in Horror, um, he has a lot of similar experiences with certain films as I had at a similar age. And I can see how the influences were quite similar there. Oh. Well, that's, that's that's an excellent answer. I think I, I think I'm actually probably going to order two at least two of those books. <laughs> yeah. So excellent. And I I like the idea of the of the injuries one. That sounds really useful. Ben um, will order them, and I will be sure to steal them when I visit. <laughs> Do so. <laughs> that is the way of life. <laughs> I've just opened Body Trauma again on a random page for Figure Eighteen Skin Cube. What? Pictures of dead skin cells germinal cells support <laughs> tissue a burn or frostbite is full thickness if below germinal layer so lo loads of uh, helpful tips and, and hints for you to read in there <laughs> when Nick, nick's response of what <laughs> to, <laughs> to skin cube is excellent i loved it right oh, the, stuff like that tickles me. the nintendo skin cube aside uh... <laughs> With hands. <laughs> oh, it's portable. It's so, so such small so discs. <laughs> so, God, right, Ben, the one that isn't causing havoc. <laughs> um, Benjamin, that's how we're differentiating, isn't it? Let's be sensible. Um, is there? Well, I don't care if there is. You're going to force you to make a choice. What's the best book you've ever read? Oh, that's horrible. There are so many at different stages of your life that you'd say, yeah, this is definitely the best book I've ever read. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, it was The Hobbit, without a doubt. Mm. Um, then I could tell you a horror story about Lord of the Rings series. <laughs> this, this is awful because um, secondary school, they had the Fellowship of the Ring in the school library. So so I took that out and I read it. And I was like, I can't wait to read more. Two Towers I went through that in a week or so. The school library did not have The Return of the King. Oh. And this is this is the, the 1990s. So that there's, there's kind of no early 90s. No other way of me obtaining this. I had nobody to take me to a library or anything. So um, I didn't read the third one. Probably until another five or six years after that oh, point no. so it doesn't quite resonate with me the same way that the hobbit did where i was able to to consume all of that but i think now i'd probably yeah a, a book called kiss me judas by will christopher bear um which is it starts with that urban legend of um, waking in a bathtub full of ice with your kidney missing <laughs> And it, that's the starting point for the story. And then he kind of tracks down the woman who did this to him. And it goes from there. And it's fabulous. That sounds, that sounds like a real thrilling read, that one. And, yeah. Yeah. And we've also got a lot of time for people that like Tolkien on this on this podcast. Tolkien. So good, good, choice, yeah. good choice. And body horror. This is, this is very much in this <laughs> podcast wheelhouse, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to have to dismember Aragorn at some point, aren't we? Oh, good grief. Please no. <laughs> Do Gimli. It will take less time. <laughs>
<laughs> so dwarf flesh looks kind of tough, like soaring through it. it takes some time. Sturdy is the word, uh, it's the preferred term. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just guiltily looked at the map of Middle Earth hanging above my desk as if to apologise. That was. Yeah, I did the same thing. I did exactly the same thing. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, that's strange. That's very strange. <laughs> uh, right. I'm going to ask you a question now, Ben. What is the worst book you've ever read? There have been a few. Normally, I, I tend to pick books I, I know I'm going to like. I'm quite safe with it. Though I have read a few books just for the purposes of review lately. And, and some of those have been... There was one which made me quite angry because it was very misogynistic. But, mm. but actually, I think that there was a book I picked up. It was called Apples. And I can't remember for the life of me who wrote it now. And what annoyed me about it was... I can't really believe it It got published by, I don't know if it's a mainstream publisher, but I picked it up in Waterstones. The big kind of thing at the end was these two characters who who told their, their story, a male character, a female character, each chapter, uh, didn't reveal their names until the end. And, and they were called Adam and Eve. And it just, oh, it just did not work. It's like, <laughs> oh, I, I cringed so hard when I got to the end of that. Absolutely. Oh, fuck no, that. awful. <laughs> It sounds like you did quite well not to throw it across the room when you finished it. Yeah, I was like, how can this be? Uh, how can this be the book that got published? How, how did this one get there? It was oh no. Maybe they thought kind of like a Bible inversion. That's sort of the beginning of the Bible, isn't it? They drop those names, so maybe stick it at the end. Yeah, it's like opening a, a mystery novel with. So the butler killed everyone, and we join the group in. <laughs> oh dear. Alas, I cannot remember the name of the author, but I don't need well, to know the name of the author yeah, because I, I won't mean... read anything else of theirs. So well, I don't know if you if you can't remember the name, you might be you might be caught caught off guard again. You'll end up with uh, with uh, some other some, some book ending on some weird note again. Yeah, and he was called Cain, and he was called <laughs> Abel. Abel. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it... right. Yes. Yeah. I don't Go think it's going to be. Is it, is it going to be? It might be Adam and Eve. They might be the answer to this question. Uh, Benjamin, <laughs> who's your favourite literary character? Um, maybe R. P. McMurphy from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, I just like the chaos that he brings to that place. I suppose part of it is you, you cannot separate that character from Jack Nicholson because obviously the, the, the film had long existed, even though I hadn't seen it before I read the book. And I think the copy I've got has even got his face on it. But kind of, I, I think he really is one who exploded on the page and really brought that to life. Or perhaps Tom Cullen from The Stand. Is there a? Is there? I haven't read the stand. Is there? Is there a similar level of uh, chaos to that character? Um, no, it's he's a character with with learning difficulties, and I only read the stand quite recently, and there are some things about it which really do not stand up particularly well. Now there are a few phrases in there which just seem a bit. Oh, that seems very dated, but his character still comes across as very sweet and innocent and the way that he's used in the end of the story and some of the things that he does it just they work really well um so i like this i like this question better we sort of sort of touched on it a little bit with uh, what you're reading at the moment but um it's always an interesting one to ask um authors that have published works and stuff uh what is your writing process it's it's been different for for each novel that I've written. Um, with with the first one, Dead Branches, I had very much kind of the starting point and what I thought was the end point in mind, and I just wrote from start point to what I thought was end point, and then the next bit that happened, and it was just a case of slogging through it with minimal plotting it then did mean a lot of editing was needed to get things happening at the right time because that one is set in 1990 at the time of the world cup and the the, the characters in it often reference who's still in the tournament they watch the games they they have this belief that their friend will be okay as long as england stay in the tournament if they win the world cup 
he will be fine. Um, so there was a lot of plotting that need. There's a lot of editing that needed to happen with that in order to keep the matches on the right day, and so that was quite hectic. <laughs> hmm. With the most recent one, with with normal, I've got four point of view characters, so I kind of had to know who was who we were following for each part of the story. So that one I was always plotting about ten chapters ahead, um, so I could see right the next two chapters are going to carry this part of Lola's story. Tom's story is going to deliver these bits. So I had to do that one in a much more thoughtful way. It wasn't a case of I could just write it. Um, even though I didn't know the ending of that one until I got there, I was always a chunk ahead. And with short stories, it tends to be a case of um, an idea tends to, to arrive from somewhere and, and then they tend to be sit down and write it and see how it works out try to kind of pull out ideas um try to find what kind of the emotional core of that story is what's the important aspect who are readers going to care about and then build in that part and layer it up from there so so what so it sounds like um you you do a fair amount of plotting for your for your novels but a bit more of like a by the seam of your pants for short stories um, that's that's certainly how it's become, become recently. Yeah. yeah. Is do do you feel like that's because you're you've become more confident in your own writing, or have you always felt quite confident in your own writing? I, I certainly have become more confident with it, and I think with when you plot it out, you meander less. I certainly threw out the first ten thousand words of Dead Branches when I realized that the story I was writing was actually the bit in 1990, not the bit in the present day. Um, and had I plotted it, then perhaps I wouldn't have, have done that. But sometimes you do need to, to write your way into something and you need to get started before you discover certain aspects. So, so there's, a, there's always a degree of just going with it and, and seeing what happens. And, and I think you've got to allow yourself to, to throw the plan out and, go in a different direction and see where it takes you sometimes. I really like the concept of the the build up writing that you just mentioned. This idea that you can just as you, you can just start to write it out and eventually you find actually where your starting point is. Um I like that. I think there's a there's, an, uh, there's sort of an idea of momentum to that kind of writing which appeals to me. Momentum is is so important. I I tend to do most of my longer writing when I've got time off um like holidays from school etc where I've got two weeks off or, or six weeks off then I, I tend to try to just plow down and get as many words done as possible there because once I've got to the end whether it's plotted or not I can then go back and fix it which you can do in smaller chunks mm. I think that's quite oh, a nice philosophy answer. the yeah. like going in with the knowledge that I can always go back and fix it so instead of being super precious on the the way through you want to get the story out I yeah I think it's quite comforting to know yeah, that a professional feels like that. There was a, somebody once said, don't worry about getting it right, worry about getting it written. And mm. then you can go, because you can spend so much time umming and ahhing about whether you're doing the right thing and whether it's going to work and whether it's good enough. And then you never get anything down. And, and it's in getting it down that, that you've then got something to think about and work with. And you can plug the, the plot holes. I mean, I had a massive plot hole in second novel is she dead in your dreams which i don't think it was until about the fourth time i was editing it and i was reading through it i'd, I'd sent it out to a few publishers without getting a lot of interest and it wasn't until i i figured out what was wrong with one of the characters and and, and how to fit them in so there was no coincidence in there that it then worked but had i have just sat there and, and not written it then i don't know if i, I would have ever worked my way around it hmm. i think that was a very encouraging answer to that question i liked it thank you i agree now talking about building on foundations of things benjamin if you could take any book and transfer it to another medium and it doesn't necessarily have to be film or tv you could be a musical a painting whatever what book would it be to which medium and why I was thinking about this recently. I, I mentioned that I'd only only read The Stand um, turn of the year. And as I was reading it, I was thinking that it's it's a novel that 
is largely about journeys. There are characters who are traveling everywhere. I would love to create like a map book, mapping all of their journeys and where they go and when. And I mean, it'd be even better if I could then road trip it and take pictures. But I mean, that's not going to happen. But still, <laughs> it'd be great to create the maps. This character goes here and when. And perhaps do that for the whole Stephen King universe. Like this is a map of Derry, um, which is used in it. Castle Rock is a town which he uses frequently. But but to be able to create like maps of those places, I think would be enormous fun. So you have two options there. You can either get Ewan McGregor involved and make it quite classy, but still cool. Or <laughs> you get Jeremy Clarkson and you get money behind it, but it definitely <laughs> won't be as classy as you want. <laughs> And you've got to uh, cut around him doing the things that he does. <laughs> I'm, I'm not King going this little American. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, it'd be the worst. <laughs> I could imagine pitching the idea. It's like, yeah, we'll do that. And then they hire Clarkson. And yeah, you yeah. go to every length you can to remove yourself from the project. Your dream project is in tatters. But, of course, that's how you end up with James May. So you need to be careful. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, mm-hmm. uh, I, I feel like you could yeah. do a drink. If it was a Stephen King, that you'd have to do a drink along. So, like every, every time you got to a place, you'd have to tell everyone you met your name was Danny, and you would have to drink a phenomenal <laughs> amount of bourbon. That could be a really good oh, trip, yeah. couldn't it? <laughs> could, could chaotic, but I mean, all the best trips are. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> Very uh, unique as well. Map books. I, I, I do like getting map books for in particular like fantasy uh, series and stuff uh, like Nick and I mentioned earlier that we've both got maps of Middle Earth in our various workplaces um, it just brings it to life a little bit which is really special yeah that there's something special you open the first page of a book and there's a map there yeah or or, or a family tree some that something that that it's like oh this is going to be epic something yeah. that tells you it's gonna be a great journey it's going to involve countless families etc yeah that can be great as soon as you need a graph to explain your work you know that you're in for a real ride i think i can feel my yeah. copy of the silmarillion staring at my back right now it's, <laughs> it's deeply <just> burning <laughs> <laughs> glowing softly <laughs> uh, this one's uh this one often gets um uh, well, it gets some very different different responses, I find. Uh, when did you last cry reading? There's, there's one which is absolutely horrendous. I, I, I had to stop for, for some time. It's, it's Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door. It's horrific. It's, it's based on a real case of um, a pair of siblings, two girls, who I think the parents died in a car crash and the aunt took them in and she starts to do horrendous things to these children and I wouldn't normally read something like that it's not kind of my kind of brand of horror um, but it's told from the perspective of the boy who lives next door hence the title the girl next door and and it's told when he's older looking back so there's this perspective where he didn't quite understand what was going on with her he didn't quite understand what his friends um because they were the children in the household were were doing and how bad it was getting so it's the things that happen between the chapters that he doesn't see which are truly horrendous and even though it tells you at the start that this is based on a real case and from the very start you know in the real case the older girl does not live it gives you hope that that this this boy is going to to somehow rescue her, and he doesn't, and it's heartbreaking and it's horrible, and yeah, I just had to stop a couple of pages from the end, and I just I couldn't go on for for for, for quite some time. Then I thought, well, I have to see it through. But yeah, sounds really that one harrowing. had me in tears. That does it is like, even your description. I was a bit like I I was I wasn't welling, but I was. Very aware that that was that would tug my heartstrings. I'm fairly sure. Lump in the throat territory. That. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Oof. Oh, right. Oh. Right. I'm. <laughs> I'm. I'm going to open fire now with. Uh, and I say it every time. It is my favourite question ever. It shouldn't really be in a story podcast, but then it possibly shouldn't exist at all. <laughs> it goes against God and nature. I only believe in one of those <laughs> things. Nature is not real. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, <laughs> can you tell me, Benjamin, one fact about you or your life that is completely uninteresting? Um, yes, I can. I often lose my slippers in my bedroom, for they are the same colour as the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> So, first, first, first fucking follow-up question. What colour is that? They're kind of a navy blue. <laughs> now, in fact, <laughs> I, I, I can and can't see them right now. I can see the outline of them because the lights are on. But, but yeah, so there, that, there's often times I can't find them. <laughs> I seek family members to help me. <laughs> this, this sounds like my worst nightmare because I'm blind as fuck, right? <laughs> <laughs> You've described my perfect hellscape. So, so like, what is it? Also, that your memory is bad, so you don't remember where you took them off, or how are we getting I mean, in this that, situation? It sounds like on the regs. It, that, it really is. I mean, this th this last year has has largely been me asking other members of my family where my slippers are <laughs> and where my phone is. <laughs> yeah. Have you considered? Leaving them on. I don't mean all the time. <laughs> Not all the time. That would be weird. Like in the bath. <laughs> well, you see, <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? It's soggy. Yeah, I mean, the, the, they're by the bed at the moment because I'm, I'm. That's where I'm perched. That's... Are you sure? So yeah. So so often it's just the bedroom floor. I've taken them off. So I'm peering again, and y yes, there was a pause. So ninety percent. It seems could, like it you would be benefit from like a pack of like golden stickers that you could just put on. <laughs> Put on your slippers. Yes. Like, make them a bit wizardy. <laughs> yes. Turn them up at the ends there with, yeah, pom poms. This is how we fix yes. this this uh, particular problem. I'm all about, all <laughs> yes. about solutions. Oh wow, that was a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> I also imagined that your like bedspread was navy blue, and your walls were navy blue, the doors navy blue, and it's a bit stormy outside. <laughs> the sky's navy blue. I'm gonna. Totally. I reckon with some body paint, we could really fuck Benjamin's day up. <laughs> <laughs> Just a pair of eyes open in the navy blue sea. That would, that would involve you and I yeah. sneaking naked into his house covered in body paint. No, no. Which... It would mean us just not leaving naked. Oh. <laughs> we have to maintain the illusion that this is all happening in one place, Ben. <laughs> so we're currently in Ben's bedroom, are we? Completely nude, looking for his slippers. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I left them in here somewhere. I think Nick ate them. <laughs> <laughs> Just covers the slipper-shaped bulge in my tummy. So I'm really, I'm uh, really keen because we've had a, we've had a good time here for you to uh, talk about you and your work. Have you got anything upcoming that people can uh, look out for? To get excited. Yeah, about? I'm currently working on a novella called the fen witch of goose feather split which i'm going to oh, self-publish that one that's a great thank name. you, <laughs> you that, that does have a... yeah i'm just i'm just going to put that one out myself so i can get it out as cheaply as possible um i'm going to do a limited run of print copies and the ebook will be as cheap as i can possibly do it perhaps free sometimes just so i can get my work out there that is in the editing stage, so um, hopefully mid-March, end of March, I'm hoping to have that available. From the name alone, it, I want a copy. So, is is that a result of the the frustrations of the um, the the COVID nineteen situation and your uh... was it was it was um some advice that was was given to me before before everything shut down. I, I went to um the UK Ghost Story Festival um December 2019. Which was fabulous. Um, it was in Derby, and they, they had lots of uh, lots of, of writers there. And Adam Neville uh, was was doing a panel, and, and I asked him uh, just, just just a question about one of the best ways to to promote your work. And he said, if if you, you're able to put something out for free, then it allows people to get to grips with your work and take a chance on something. So I thought, yeah, I mean, worth a go. Oh, that's, yeah, that does sound like a very good idea. And uh, if you uh... If you send us over a, a link to it, we'll be sure to uh, to push it as well. Will do. Thank you. Well, it's been absolutely excellent talking to you. Um, where can people find you on social media? Or anywhere? I think Twitter. Twitter is probably the one that I update the most. Where I'm, um, you can find me under Benjamin Langley, or that it's at b underscore j underscore Langley. Excellent. 
tend to, to link to my blog recent um quite regularly on there. That's something I've tried to update more than once a month recently. I noticed that you had a you had a um a, a regular blog. That's that's a that's something uh, that we can applaud for sure. Um, I know every time I've started a blog, it's died off relatively quickly. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those uh, those first four entries are always really strong, and then uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, fuck, yeah. I had a blog last year. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, when I look at the um, because it's on WordPress, you can look at the stats and whatnot. I think there was 2019. There was one post on there which was about it being World Dracula Day and me watching one of the the dodgy Christopher Lee Hammer horror sequels <laughs> that was set in the modern day, and that was the only thing I put on there that year. But I'm, I'm quite regular at the moment with with updates on there. I think it's everything well, though. I must have started. A dozen diaries over my thirty and a bit years, and I don't think I've ever made it past January the seventh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. Uh, I definitely found that it was um, it it was sort of, sort of something that I was I found easier to work on while single. I think I don't know why that had an impact, but I maybe I was more sort of angsty and all that kind of thing. So. Uh... Just yeah. putting putting together blog posts and throwing them out there. There's some sort of human connection, I guess. Nah, fuck human connections. I'm done with this. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wrote us an excellent story today, Ben, and you've been an excellent guest. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me on. It's been it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on your chosen service so that you don't miss out on future episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, where you can talk to us directly and even suggest prompts for upcoming stories. If you're not a tweeter, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram as well. Just search for The Tiny Bookcase. Now, if you want to support the podcast, and we'd really appreciate it if you did, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the tiny bookcase. And then you can be just as special as these story seekers. Do we thank them? I think so. Well, then it's a huge thank you to the legendary Matthew McLaren and the absolutely epic Scott Byrne for their support. Thanks for listening. Catch you next week. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> Make it slimy. Make it slimy, Nick.